look quickly uh, to take you on a trip. You know, you look out of the night time, you see the stars, and they're always in the same places and in their courses. So the God of the universe has a order. And uh, the church has given order to us as well. The, uh, the whole world is broken up into 13 divisions. So if you picture different parts of the world, and our part here is called the South Pacific Division, which goes from Pitcairn, right out uh, in the Pacific there, uh, across to Perth, and uh, includes New Guinea and all of the Pacific Islands uh, in that. Uh, in amongst that, we have four division, uh, four unions. We have the uh, Papuan New Guinea Union, which is one. Australia is another one, the Australian Union Conference. Then you have the Trans-Pacific Union uh, Mission, which takes in from the Solomons right across uh, and it's uh, centred in, in uh, Fiji. And uh, the one area remaining is our area, which is North and South New Zealand, New Caledonia, the Cook Islands and French Polynesia. And so that makes up our New Zealand Pacific uh, Union. And uh, last week I've just come back from some time over in New Caledonia we have two French-speaking territories. Uh, it's New Caledonia and French Polynesia. So uh, we have a very interesting union. And in amongst that, of course, we have the Dateline. We would be the only union in the world, only part of the, ch the world church, that has the Dateline that actually runs right through it. So this morning, um, you know, I get emails and stuff that come through from the Cook Islands, uh, Pitcairn, and French Poly because it's Friday over there. And then tomorrow morning when I go for my walk, I need to remember to pray for them because they're having worship at Sabbath there. So uh, we've got a, an interesting union. The other little part that I just wanted to, to share with you that since we've given you all that information, you probably either got, got it or you're all confused now. But uh, right throughout that territory, um, once every five years, we bring together all the pastors and their spouses uh, to one central location for a time of fellowship, for a time of professional development and uh, nurture, etc. And that's happening next week in Rotorua. So uh, on Monday uh, through until Thursday, we'll be uh, a gathering of 250 uh, pastors and uh, spouses. Got to use that term today because we've got some ladies who are uh, ministers, so we use the word spouse now. Um, so they will be gathering there, and uh, we have Ranko Stefanovic, uh, who is the uh, a teacher at the uh, professor at Andrews University in in the states, uh, who is a specialist, has written the most up to date and current material on the Book of Revelation. Uh, it's a book that's available in the, from the ABC. Uh, he will be coming out and he will be the uh, main presenter. We also have uh, Ben Maxim and his wife Mary. Mary will be ministering to the, uh, the, the ladies of the, uh, of the group. And uh, we did have Gary Gibbs coming, who's the Vice President of Hope uh, TV. But uh, in the two hours this morning, uh, travelling hear that we got news that Gary has succumbed, he's actually in intensive care with his wife uh, in Maryland, or in the hospital there, that um, at this time of the year in Maryland and Pennsylvania there's a disease and the medical folk, Lorraine will know, for, for, you get from ticks, Lyme something? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, but it, it's quite devastating apparently and it has, um, he's getting neurological so those medical people who love those sort of terms, to me uh, he's in a bad way and he needs God's prayers. So they're unable to come and then t within two hours this morning, uh, Brad Thorpe, uh, who's the president of Hope TV, um, has rearranged his program, cancelled some things, uh, booked an airfare and he is coming uh, to take Gary's place. So we will still have him there. So, uh, yeah, we just need to uh, remember Gary and his wife. Uh, both of them have uh, succumbed to this uh, illness, which uh, they get from ticks at this time of the year, which is 
they're entering into their, their spring there now. So, um, this morning. When I was about somewhere in the 10, 11 years of age uh, category, uh, my older brother, I've got a brother who's four years older and a sister who's almost four years younger. Uh, we were out on the farm and uh, dairy farm on the Darling Downs there in Queensland and yeah, he went off to high school in, and that necessitated he needed to go into to town and to board there and so I became the big boy on the farm and uh, it was my lot at the weekends to be able to go down and take the horse and uh, we we're having a, quite a dry spell and a bit like what they've been through in the Waikato and uh, we'd put the cows out in the long paddock and so once they got out there and got going uh, we, on some feed the heads would go down so I went down this day and just found a little gully and was lying back in the gully and I'd undone one of the reins and just wrapped it around my foot and the horse is feeding and looking up at the clouds and uh, probably in our world today I can see some smiles but you don't get much time to look at the clouds today um, but uh, there I was this young guy all on his own and uh, looking up and watching the clouds and you know how just on a normal sort of a day clouds will be there and uh, little bits will come and join them and then they tend to, to break away well I need to back up just at this stage and share something else because uh, my grandmother, my mum's mum, uh, had been with us on the farm for quite a long time and as long as I can ever remember of grandma um, and my memory isn't all that crash hot these days but she was not very well. She used to um, uh, very keen on the garden, she was a, a German lady and so what she basically grew in the garden, that's what we ate on the table. And some of you have grew up that way as well. So what the cows produced and the garden produced, uh, plus a vela here and there, that was our, uh, our lifestyle. But uh, as I uh, got a little bit older, um, you know, Grandma was confined to a bed. And there was no rest homes or whatever of that nature out where we were. And... And then uh, it got to the stage I used to go and see her before I'd go off to school of a morning on the old truck and then um, mum said that it, it wasn't possible for me to see grandma. And you know, you've got to realise it was a different world. Today, you know, children have access and, and all of that stuff but back in those days in the understanding and the culture of my parents that death and children and sickness and children just, they were kept way apart. So I didn't see Grandma the last couple of weeks of her life. And um, she was, I guess, to me, the, you know, that stable person. She always had time for you. Uh, learned a lot from Grandma, uh, besides pinching the little uh, cauliflower heads before they were due out of the garden. But... Um, so in my mind, I wondered where Grandma had gone as a young child. Uh, the day of the funeral, uh, one of the neighbours, Roy Henrahan, came over and helped us milk that afternoon. And uh, so, yeah, none of the... It just sort of cut off from seeing her to not seeing her. And so in my little mind, and I didn't have the privilege of being in a Christian home uh, and going to Sabbath school or those things, so... In my mind, uh, I wondered what had happened to Grandma. And you didn't talk about those sort of things. So it was there, I guess, bubbling away there somewhere. And here I was looking up and watching this cloud come together. Ten-year-old boy lost in his thoughts. And you know, just as this cloud formed and then it just started dispersing little bits and I went away and it was gone. And the most horrible thought came into my mind, is that what's happened to Grandma? Is that what's going to happen to me? And you know, this, you know, I'm getting a, a chill right now going down my spine. It's the most horrible thing. And I just whipped down the blind of my thinking on that altogether, jumped up, 
connected back up and hop on the horse and went and did something else. And you know, it was 20 years before that blind lifted up again. And what I want to share with you this morning is what I wish I would have known then as a young fellow. What do we got to do to get there? It is. You've got to do nothing. Isn't that fantastic? Um, so basically, this morning, um, you're at a at a a drive-in. You're at a drive-in Bible show because most of what I've got is on the screen this morning. It's it's a concentration on our God. And so let's, uh, let's read uh, what is there. The prophet, these are these are from Isaiah 42, 44 and 45. The prophet exalted God as creator of all. His message to the cities of Judah was, Behold your God. Thus saith God the Lord, He that created the heavens and stretched them out, He that spread forth the earth, and that which cometh out of it, I am the Lord that maketh all things. I form the light and I create darkness. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, God says, have stretched out the heavens and all their host have I commanded. You know, uh, we live in an incredible world as a people. And, uh, you know, I think of those people who lived uh, in the time of Isaiah or Jeremiah or one of those prophets, um, and to have that person living there and to be giving us counsel from God. And, you know, we as a people have been specially blessed by the insight that Ellen White has brought uh, to us as a people. And I just want to share uh, two slides of a statement because this is worth a million dollars of anybody's money. Satan will manufacture his diversions that men may not think about God. The world, filled with sport and pleasure-loving, is always thirsting for some new interest. And how little time and thought are given to the creator of the heavens and the earth. God calls upon his creatures to turn their attention from the confusion and the perplexity around them. This is written, you know, last century, way, way back. We think today, you know, that things are, uh, are you know, we've got a whole lot on, on our plate. But back then, from the confusion and perplexity all around them and admire his handiwork, the heavenly bodies are worthy of contemplation. God has made them for the benefit of man. Did you get that? The creation of those heavenly bodies are there for the benefit of man. And as we study his works, angels of God will be by our side to enlighten our minds and guard them from satanic deception. As you look at the wonderful things God's hand has made, let your proud, foolish hearts feel its dependence and inferiority. As you consider these things, you will have a sense of God's condescension. That word we talked about in our Sabbath school lesson today. So... I want to take us on a journey, a little bit of a journey this morning, and I, I uh, most certainly don't profess to be um, an expert in the area of where we're going. Just like we said in our Sabbath school class, I'm a simple farm boy, and if it gets any more difficult than that, uh, I won't be able to share it with you. But I think we need to be able to understand it at that level because that's where our God came down to. He came down here. The creator of this world came down and walked here among men so that we would understand. He came to reveal God to us. 
That uh, is just a, a little simple illustration of our solar system. And uh, so let's have a, uh, a bit of a look at it individually. The sun. You know, without the sun, well, there would be no life. The sun is the star that belongs to the earth and the distance from us to the sun is 150 million kilometres. I'm going to use some figures this morning that we probably only usually identify with the debt of America. Um, they're huge. And, uh, you know, when we get a lot of noughts on the end of stuff, we get millions and billions and then trillions and so forth, uh, we lose a bit of sight of reality. But just try to, to journey along, along with me. The sun is a massive, huge gas ball. Uh, on its surface, the temperature is 6,000 degrees centigrade. Now, you know, we just looked and we said 150 million kilometres away. And for us light-skinned people out there in the middle of summer, 10, 15 minutes, and what do we get? Sunburn. If you're out there for an hour, you get worse than that, you get cooked. <laughs> and, uh, of course, off comes, off comes the, the skin. The sun is about 109 times the size of the earth. It's 333,000 times heavier uh, than the earth. It's light, and I won't go into the number of the, the, the power of, of the light of the sun, but its light needs eight minutes from there to, to here. The next one out from there is Mercury. It's one of the nine planets of our solar system. It's the nearest to the sun, very small planet, has a diameter of just under 5,000 kilometres. And then we come to Venus. Venus is the second one uh, orbiting the sun. It's almost as big as our Earth. It has a diameter of just over 12,000 kilometres. And uh, because of its very dense atmosphere, it's impossible to actually see its surface. Uh, its atmosphere is composed of something that we're very familiar with here. It's composed of carbon dioxide. The pressure on its surface is enormous and it has a temperature of 500 degrees centigrade. And then we come to this place that you and I are very familiar with. The Earth is the only one that we are aware of in our solar system where there is life. We spoke of the distance between the two. From us to the sun is 150 million kilometres. Our Earth has a diameter of 12,756 kilometres. That's going around the equator. Our Earth is almost a perfect sphere, almost. It's 12,756 kilometres around the equator and it's 12,714 around the poles. But because it's circling around, they say that the effect and the thrust of that um, motivational force uh, extends us out, the mass extends out a little bit at the equator. So there's a difference of 42 kilometres. So it's like some of us as we get a bit older, you know, we get a bit of a bulge around the middle. Well, our Earth is the, um, our Earth is the same. You know, it takes um, the, uh, the area around, uh, we, we spoke of there, for us, for it to turn around, for our Earth to, to turn around, it's going at a speed of, and I've just momentarily lost it, but it's just, uh, it's over, I think it's about 16, I did write it down somewhere, but about 1,600 kilometres an hour. 
that is our speed. That's at the equator. As you move further towards the South Pole or the North Pole, it's going to get less and less because right at the pole, there's not going to be a lot of, of uh, speed of turning there at all. So we're, we're about, you picture where we are from the equator to the uh, South Pole and even in the, the length of New Zealand, uh, we're a lot further here north than what we are down at Invercargill, so maybe we're a little bit over 1,000 or 1,000 to 1,200 kilometres an hour we're moving. You know, we think that we're sitting still here this morning, but we're going at least a 1,000 kilometres an hour that we're spinning around this way, the Earth on its axis, and at the same time, we're moving on a, a journey around the sun. And that speed that we're moving around the sun, we're travelling at 107,279 kilometres an hour. That's huge speed. You know, you'll probably get a ticket if you were, if the radar gentleman caught you at that speed. The circumference that our Earth goes on on that journey around the sun is 940 million kilometres. And why I shared these little snippets of information with you this morning is that, you know, you and I have one of these things, most of us. Olympic Games coming up in Beijing in a little while and our swimmers will swim or win a race maybe by so many hundreds of a second. And the reason we can have these things and talk in that sort of language is because our awesome, powerful creator God takes this massive planet on this 940 million kilometre journey around the sun, spinning at the same time as it's travelling at that enormous speed and brings it back to exactly the same spot in this universe in 365 days and a few hours and a few minutes and a few seconds. Perfectly. A little ten-year-old boy would have loved to have had a snippet of that those, all those years ago. And we've had a... Oh, there it was. Our little piece of information. We can't lose it for those who love pieces of information. It's uh, turning on its axis at approximately 1,674 kilometres an hour. The next place that we come to is Mars. It's uh, a rather small planet, a diameter of about half the size uh, of our Earth, and it has a cold surface, minus 23 degrees centigrade. Then we come to Jupiter. It's the biggest planet of our solar system and its diameter is approximately 11 times the size of Earth. Then we come to Saturn and it's the one that's got the, the rings around it. It has about 24 satellites rotating around it. Uh, it is the second biggest planet of our solar system. The next one out is uh, Uranus. Uh, it is 2,869 million kilometres away from the sun. Quite a, quite a distance out. About four times the size of our Earth. The next one is Neptune. And it's, we're getting smaller now. It's about four times uh, Earth's size. And the last one, Pluto is a very small and a very cold planet. It has a diameter of 2,400 uh, kilometres. So a quick little journey uh, there through our, our solar system. But let's have a look now because uh, if you're like me, uh, you may be a visual and it's a lot easier seeing things than hearing about things. 
So we spoke of, uh, of Pluto, so there's Pluto, Mercury, Mars, Venus and Earth. That's in their approximate sizes. So you got that picture in your mind? Okay, when we spoke about how much bigger they were, there's Pluto, there's Earth and there's Jupiter. Quite huge in comparison. So lock that into number two in your brain and then we come to the Sun. And there we've got Pluto, Earth, we've got to identify it. There was Jupiter that appeared to be so huge and compared with the Sun. But beyond our Sun, it's a huge, massive universe out there. Because there's the next stage and you can see the Sun. And we had that in our mind as how big it was. And we look out towards Arcturus. So grab that one. And we have a look now and see Arcturus. Third one along on the left from the bottom. And we come up through Betelgeuse and Antares. God keeps them all functioning in place. Antares is the 15th brightest star that we know of in the sky. It is more than 1,000 light years away. And I mentioned to you before, we need to keep things very simple. So in case you're wondering how far a light year is, just to make it real easy, it's nine plus all of that stuff. <laughs> okay, some of these bright boys sitting in row number two here. Uh, you'll be able to tell me afterwards how big that is. When Dad's bank account gets half that size, you won't need to ever have to work, hopefully. That's how far away it is. And the next photo that we have um, is a real challenge for our mind because we're going right, right out there now. This is a, uh, from the Hubble telescope, is an... A uh, picture of the ultra deep field infrared view of countless entire galaxies these are and they're described as billions of light years away so you saw that number before that took up the whole screen these you can multiply that by at least a billion and that's what it looks like these are entire galaxies And when we read there before, we are told that we need to study the things to understand the mighty power of our Creator God. Statement from the book Adventist Home. When we look on the glories of the heavens, now scanned afar through the telescope, when the blight of sin removed, the whole earth, shall appear in the beauty of the Lord our God, what a field will be opened to our study. You know, when the effect of sin on our human minds and our ability is taken away, what a field will be available for us. To whom, Isaiah says, to whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal? says the Holy One. We spoke in our Sabbath school class about, you know, the worship of idols, of, uh, of things made of, of uh, the things that God has created. Lift your eyes and look to the heavens, he says. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls them each by name. I go for a walk of the morning when I'm home and uh, uh, because of the, the way with our daylight saving, it closed in very early this year, so uh, it's walking in the dark. And uh, I go around an area, and uh, then I take a sharp right turn, and as I turn and you just look up, and man, there's the stars, you know, on a clear night. They're all sitting there, and I just... There's a time I spend uh, in, in quietness with God and talking with him, and you know, this text jumps out at me uh, when I come and I just see that. Not one of them is missing. 
Why? Because of his great power and mighty strength. We, my friends, understand not even, not even the tiniest tissue paper that you could put be between our fingers of the, the knowledge and the wisdom and the power of our God, that this is sustained in place. Whenever I get, um, you know, bombarded by the, uh, the enemy, and he has a few here on earth that give him a hand at times, um, and I... You know, feel like the truckload of gravel's been dumped. This is where I go back to. This is where I find the strength of my God. This is, this is his world. And he's given us the privilege. He says these things are created for our benefit. That we might see them and might acknowledge who he is. And you know that picture we saw before, all of those galaxies? Well, they zeroed in on the darkest spot, the, the tiniest, darkest spot that they could find and tweaked it up and went into there and this is what they found. So even the darkest spot where it appeared to be nothing, when they intensified the vision of it, there was still more there to be seen. For this is what the Lord says, he who created the heavens, he is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, he founded it. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. He says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Under the heading, heavenly knowledge will be progressive. All the treasures of the universe will be open to the study of God's redeemed. Unfettered by mortality. Here we're, we're constricted and constrained by mortality. Unfettered by mortality, they wing their tireless flight to worlds afar. Worlds that thrilled with sorrow at the spectacle of human woe and rang with songs of gladness at the tidings of a ransomed soul. With unutterable delight, the children of earth enter into the joy and the wisdom of unfallen beings. They share the treasures of knowledge and understanding gained through the ages upon ages in contemplation of God's handiwork. If there's ever one thing wrong with television, my friends, it's it keeps us inside of a night time and not outside to see God's handiwork. There would be millions of people in the world today that never even have a look up and see what is there. See the handiwork of our, of our God. With undimmed vision, they gaze upon the glory of creation. And notice... And this was written way before Hubble telescopes were around. Suns and stars and systems, all in their appointed order, circling the throne of deity. Upon all things, from the least to the greatest, the creator's name is written. And in all are the riches of his power displayed. This is what the Lord says. He who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and the stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, the Lord Almighty is his name. Job. Listen to this, Job. Stop and consider God's wonders. Do you know how God controls the clouds and makes his lightning flash? Do you know how the clouds hang poised? There was a little 10-year-old boy that struggled to know how the clouds hung poised. Those wonders of him who is perfect in knowledge. 
you who swelter in your clothes when the land lies hushed under the south wind. Another little peek through the telescope. From the book Christian Courage, page 49. The precious gems of light studying the heavens to make the night beautiful, the exhaustless riches of the sunlight, the solemn glories of the moon, the winter's cold, the summer's heat, the changing recurring seasons, in perfect order and harmony, controlled by infinite power. Here are subjects which call for deep thought, for the stretch of the imagination. The psalmist says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Who have set your glory above the heavens? When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. No wonder those patriarchs of long ago could come out from their tent and look up and commune with God. All his power was there displayed. Every night he put on the greatest television show ever. As we look at some of those nebulas, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament show his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Don't you love the language, you know, that these people tried to describe? Without the, the telescopes, without all the information, if we could put it that way, that we have today. This is how it appeared. You know, the sun coming out, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his, out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man ready to, to run his race. You know, we talk about... You know the sun coming up in the morning? Sun's coming and going nowhere, is it? <laughs> We've turned around. The sun's still on track. I'm pleased the, the sun doesn't come up and go down because God's got us turning perfectly by his mighty unseen hand. Then there is nothing hidden from its heat. It's all there for us to see. It leads us to praise. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him all his angels. Praise him all his hosts. Praise him sun and moon. Praise him all you stars of light. Praise him, you heavens of heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. God's glory in the heavens, the innumerable worlds in their orderly revolutions, the balancing of the clouds, Job 37.16. The mysteries of light and sound of day and night, all, my friends, were objects of study by the pupils of Earth's first school. I'd have just, man, I'd have loved to have been there on Sabbath morning when God turned up in Eden. What a Sabbath school. There would have been nobody late for that one. Hey? <laughs> What a Sabbath school as the creator of it all. You know, if you go to a master craftsman, whatever it is that he's making, and you know, you look there at 
whatever and, and try to take it all in. And then he sees your attention and he comes over and asks a question and you start asking and then he gives you the depth of what was in behind his mind and his thinking and the rationale in creating that thing. Just what it was like there in Eden as Adam and Eve asked those questions. Of the Creator and the, and the Sabbath, the subheading there in Christian Courage, who gives us the sunshine which makes the earth bring forth and bear? And who the fruitful showers? Who has given us the heavens above and the sun and the stars in the heavens? Every time we look at the world, we are reminded of the mighty hand of God which called it into existence. Psalm 103. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. The sun rising in the heavens is a representative of him. And you know, when I was doing some research on this, I had never ever read that statement. Powerful, isn't it? The sun rising in the heavens is a representative of him who is the life and light of all that he has made. All the brightness and beauty that ordain the earth and light up the heavens speak of God. You know, and we've often said, you know, that we have these revelations, we have the written word, we have nature, and we pass it over as simply as that. And what we're looking at this morning is just the tiniest snippet of the things of God's creation. And that text that we all know so very well, the, the giving this, the, the three angels' message, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. Why? Because one, the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made the heavens and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. The call today is to come back to the worship of the one who is all deserving of our worship. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power. And you know, I can only just begin to imagine with the tiniest, tiniest use of, of uh, whatever resources available to imagine the power of God. How all of this through space is held in place. Recently I, I saw uh, um, a DVD of um, how our world is structured. If, if things around us with all of our spheres around us, etc., if things were moved one way or the other, just a short distance, we would either cook or we would freeze. Just absolutely mind-boggling uh, stuff. Our God has the power to sustain all of this in place. And one day we will see the unfallen worlds and those individuals there. So this God of absolute awesome power and when we think of power we tend to think usually of bigness you know the V8's better than the V4 you know the all of that the boys that have got a bit of a you know love the scent of uh, a bit of av gas going through the, the V8 bit more power coming on but we tend to think of it you know the, the big trucks that are out at the mines you know huge stuff stand beside a wheel and you're looking at the you know, the bottom nut on the, on, the, uh, on the hub. 
But when I contemplate my God and I think of this person who has all of this ability at his disposal and it tells us that his arm rules for him, here's this power being extended and his reward is with him when he comes. I think of the God who our brother shared with us in Sabbath school this morning who's interested in the life of one of those children on the streets there in Cambodia. One of those little girls who's being molested and, and abused. Just one of those is so precious to him. To the God who has all might and all power at his disposal is the God who tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. And you know, we love, we love these sort of uh, imagery and you'll see the pictures and you'll see the white fluffy lamb and you know the shepherd holding it here or around his neck uh, there. But you know, reality is that lambs and sheep are not nice, cuddly, fluffy things. They're only like that when they're dead. In reality, when they're alive, I'll just say they're smelly. That tells us so much more about the shepherd though, doesn't it? I've picked a few of them up. And you know, you get home and your wife says, where have you been? You know, clothes get hung out in the back veranda. But this is our shepherd. The God of all power and all might is so interested that he takes one of these right to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. It's pretty humbling, isn't it? The question then is asked, how big are you? How big am I? When we get too big to kneel at the foot of the cross, We've lost the plot. When you consider, and I hope you take away with you, this coming week when somebody upsets you, this morning, guy in a little red car zoomed in and just missed the front of my car by tissue paper stuff. And uh, you could just see the guy was angry, upset, who knows what had started his day, but he flew up past other cars and uh, I was sitting about a hundred and, yeah. People upset you in the world, you know. But when you bring it all into context, it really doesn't mean a lot, does it? May God bless you this coming week.